So we're moving on to our next set of notes in unit four on sensation and perception, and this one being not about vision, not about hearing, but our other senses, which include smell, taste, and touch. So let's first talk about our somatic senses, which is our skin and our body, right? And this is the soma to sensory cortex in your brain in your parietal lobe. So our sense of touch is a mix of four distinct skin senses, and you need to memorize these four. Pressure, and then I can feel the pressure of someone touching me or the pressure of the bracelet on my wrist. Warmth and cold and pain. And we have different, very distinct skin senses for each of those. Only pressure has identifiable receptors. All the other skin sensations are variations of pressures, warmth, cold, and pain. Okay, so we have different uh, sensory receptors for each type of pressure or sensation that we might have on our skin. A really quick note about um, our sensation when we have a combination of cold water and warm water. When we put our hand under, like let's say you turn on cold water on your kitchen sink and you make your hot water turn till, you don't turn it up all the way, just warm. If you get it just right, when you go and touch that, you will perceive burning hot. This is the same reason why um, you come in from playing in the snow, maybe you forgot your gloves and you turn on like um, even cold or warm water and it feels burning hot. Okay, that's, just, that's the same reason. So pain, it tells the body that something has gone wrong, right? That's all that pain is. Pain is of the mind, essentially, and it's an evolutionary advantage, right? Like it tells you something is wrong and you need to get away from whatever it is that's going wrong, and so it causes some anxiety. Usually pain results from damage to the skin and other tissues. There is a rare disease in which a person actually feels no pain. It's known as congenital insensitivity to pain. Um, which, wow, like how cool, you never feel pain, right? Actually, no, it's not. Um, the main features of congenital insensitivity to pain is a lack of pain sensation, but intense and very frequent injuries to arms, legs, and mouth, inability to sweat, infection of joints, bone fractures. They might have like a painful stomach ulcer, but they don't feel it. So they don't know to go to the doctor and therefore end up dying of something that could have been cured, right? Um, think of a, a little girl like Ashley Blocker on the right here. She feels no pain and no hot or cold. So she could very much severely third degree burn herself and not even know it. When she's teething as a baby, she could teethe on her fingers to a point where she's gnawing off her fingers. She won't feel it. Like that could become infected and kill her. Their life expectancy is very much shorter than that of a person who can feel pain. So the biopsychosocial influences of pain, we have our personal pain experience, but it's influenced by all kinds of things. Obviously the biological influences of there's pain sensations being sent up to your brain, right? The psychological influences is, are you paying attention to it and therefore do you even know you're in pain? But then the learning based on experience and the expectation of pain relief. Do you know it's going to be relieved? And that'll kind of help you with your perception of pain. And if, it's, if you don't feel like it's going to be re relieved, that causes more anxiety. And then there's the social cultural influences, like the presence of others um, could influence pain and in how you perceive it. Empathy for others' pain, but also cultural expectations. Like think of the difference between how men and women are allowed according to our society and culture, to sense and perceive and react to pain. The gate control theory was proposed, um, it says that our spinal cord contains neurological gates that either block pain or allow it to be sensed. And substance P is a neurotransmitter involved that um, involved in the transmission of pain messages. It tells the gates to open and send the message to the brain. Something that kind of supports this theory. Um, have you ever hurt yourself? Like say you knock your elbow on the table and you rub it, right? Rubbing it actually helps. The sensation of you rubbing whatever is painful sends new pain, new sensory messages to your spine. Your spine will open the messages to the rubbing sensation, close to the pain messages. This is the same if you ever have a friend who you're like, man, my tooth is killing me. I just got this terrible toothache or I have a terrible headache and they punch you like in the chest or on the arm, right? And you're like, oh my God, that hurts so bad. And they're like, but your tooth doesn't hurt anymore. They actually have some research to defend them there because you're right, like, wow, it doesn't. 
because now I'm thinking about how bad it hurts when you punch me in my arm. So where are the pain messages sent in the brain? You've got to write this down. So pain sensory input relayed by the thalamus. First, if, like let's say you burn your arm, that message is sent to your spine and then straight to the thalamus. Then it's sent to multiple areas, to our sensory cortex. So this is sensory components of pain, judgments of pain, quality, location, and intensity, knowing where it's come from and how painful it is, how bad is the injury. Then there's areas of the limbic system, including the, the amygdala. So primary emotional and motivational components of pain, like with the hypothalamus, immediate unpleasantness and a desire to escape. This is the fight or flight, I've got to get away from this. Um, and then it's sent to the prefrontal cortex, your frontal lobe. Um, a secondary emotional and motivational components of pain and suffering. You worry about the future, causing more anxiety and just that ugly cycle in the perception of pain. Pain control, by a number of therapies available to us, including medication, surgery, acupuncture, exercise, hypnosis, and even thought distraction, right, with the idea of gate control theory. Phantom limb pain, um, this is pain that says that it's not merely the result of stimulation. Phantom limb pain is a sensation. People who are missing a limb from amputation, right, they feel painful sensations that seem to be originating from the missing part. So phantom limb sensations could be due to cross wiring in the somatosensory cortex with nearby areas taking over for the missing limb. So stimulation of those parts causes a sensation in the missing limb as if it's there. Um, it's just the part of your brain being stimulated where that part was and they actually sense it.